Hey everybody, this is Mike with Hamburg Honey. We are getting set up here in our room, so you'll be able to start seeing the live video of our presentation here just in a few minutes. We're going to get started. Um, we won't be able to do any chat with you, but if you leave any questions or comments, we'll be able to answer them later on this afternoon or tomorrow. So, hope you guys enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's worse. Wait, what um, is they... the TV again? Oh, my God. You changed the TV. Okay. Are you ready? No, yeah, they changed they... the TV again. They keep changing it. Maybe. Yeah. I didn't see it. Oh, right. The computer. Oh. Why does my computer Okay, we're back. So we're going to be handing out some red tickets here. Those, That's a drawing for a Nikot queen ring system. It's a system that allows you to raise queens without actually having to graft them. So a lot of people can't see those anymore, the the cells to graft anymore. So that's a, a resolution for it. So, yeah. Yeah, it randomly just keeps switching back to the Yeah. OK, so Carrie can introduce this Sure. All right. Let's get everybody in and seated. Thanks, guys, for coming. Um, this is Mike and Lori Lawrence. They're with Hamburg Honey, one of the local um, apiaries in this area. There it goes. <laughs> um, they have been um, beekeeping for how many years now? Uh, a little over 11. I was yeah. going to say 10, so I was good. Yeah. Um, they are also master beekeepers and um, actually teach classes here at NTC as well. Um, so they are very good experts in what you're about to learn. So good luck with that. These are your parting gifts for being here today. Oh, okay. And these bees were made by um, the NTC um, students in, over in the tech. So, so I have to share this with Mike? Yeah, you have to share it with Mike. <laughs> Oh. Um, but if you're really nice and you know sure. the lady that works here, she might get you one. Okay. <laughs> Did everybody get a folder? No. There's a folder up here with some printouts for you. And Mike, do you have those tickets? You need them? Mike, he's giving oh, out tickets. Okay. Morning, fellow beekeepers. We hope you're all having fun at Beak Meet. Um, Mike and I are on the planning committee, so if you all have any questions or concerns, you can come to us or any of the volunteers and committee members in the mint green t-shirts, and we'll address your concerns. We'd like to thank all our vendors and sponsors for coming and supporting Beak Meet. Make sure you visit all their booths and stock up on your bee season keeping supplies. Um, if y'all have any questions on this presentation, write your questions down, because at the end we'll do a Q&A uh, for any questions you might have on anything we're presenting to you. Um, Mike and I have been beekeeping for 11 plus years, and we've been master beekeepers for two years. Um, today we won't get into any too much detail on grafting. There's a lot of details and subtleties um, that we just don't have enough time to delve into. Um, if you're interested in that, we're, we are holding um, an advanced beekeeping class in May. And during that class, one of the topics is um, we teach students how to graft queens. We let you graft your own queens. And three weeks later, you get to take your own queen home to make a split or whatever you want to do with that queen. 
Um, uh oh. I hit a button. Is it? Yeah, it's the wrong view. Okay. Oh, that's good enough. Okay. Um, there's three different ways to raise queens. We'll be concentrating on three of these methods. One is using swarm cells to make nukes. Then there's the Miller method. And then there's just grafting. Um, queen rearing equipment styles are JZBZ, which is the first one, and then the NICOT grafting method. And if you got your red ticket, we'll be giving a NICOT grafting set away at the end. Um, and then there's the Miller method. So timing is everything. When should you start raising queens? The first thing you must consider is the status of your drones. While your queens will usually not mate with drones from the same apiary, you must consider the drone status in general in your area. The first sign a capped brood is not quite the time to start. Drones take 24 days on average just to emerge. Then drones need to be about two weeks old before they sexually mature. That's 36 days from the time you start seeing drone brood. The nukes that you built for your queen will also be more likely to accept her if there's a nectar flow going on. In our neck of the woods here, that's usually around the first week of June. We're assuming it's gonna be earlier this year because it's been so much warmer. And that would probably be black locust and blackberry. So, before we go to the this slide, um, when she was talking about timing, um, it's one of the most important things that you have to pay attention to when you're raising queens. Uh, last year, we did a bunch of graphs in August, and I have a special app on my phone that you just put in the date that you grafted, and it'll tell you what day that you should take those cells out and what day you should build your nukes and everything. And apparently I put the wrong day in it because when we went back on the day to take the cells out, we opened it up and there was 25 virgin queens running around in the hive. So we spent almost two hours go combing through that hive. Um, we ended up catching like 13 of them, um, but it was a total mess. I sat for like three days and tried to figure out how I was going to blame Lori for it, but <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of anything. So, um, Always a scapegoat. <laughs> yep. so the reason I have this graphed up there is this is the, the quality of Queens you're going to get depending on what method you use to raise those Queens. So this first line that uh, 9.4 millimeters, that's the average size of the queen cell in an emergency queen. Okay. So, if you go down the line, that second line, that's from the Nightcock queen rearing system. And these are all just averages. Um, 9.8 millimeters, that's the average size of a swarm cell. And then the 10 millimeters, that's the average size of like a JZBZ cell cup if you use those. The reason that's so important is because if you look on the, the red underlying numbers, those are the number of ovarellies that are in a queen's ovary um when she's raised in those aspects so a 9.4 the emergency cell you're going to have 50 fewer than if you had grafted that queen okay so the next slide um so every ovarelli Ovarials. i don't i always say it wrong okay um they can produce five to seven eggs per day so a grafted queen has almost 50 more uh, of a rallies, I'm sorry, then an emergency cell queen. Okay. So that means a queen that is bred in an emergency cell is going to produce approximately 1200 eggs per day. Okay. If you compare that to a queen that was reared in a swarm cell, that's going to be about 1430. And a queen that you raised in a grafting cell is going to have just over 1500. Okay. So what that means is the difference between a good queen and a great queen is cumulative. A great queen will lay about 9,000 more eggs per month or around 36,000 more eggs per season. So keep that in mind. A three pound package is about 10,000 bees. So that is a lot more bees in the hive producing honey. You get a lot more winter bees. So it really adds up. So why are queens that you raise yourself better than the ones that you can purchase? Okay. 
entomologist Jeff Pettis of the USDA, he did a study um, on queens that were shipped to him. So what he did is he had his uh, people install them back to him in their normal manner. Um, so they know that queens that are exposed to temps over 104 degrees or below 41 degrees for only one hour, they lose a lot of their sperm viability. Okay. So they found that 20% of the queens that were shipped to them had reached those temperature extremes and uh, they had lost up to 50% of their viability. So, I mean, I'm not blaming or putting down queen breeders. They do a great job. Um, some of these guys raid 10, 15, 50,000 queens a year. Um, that's just astronomical. They're, there's just certain things that they can't control. Um, the longer a queen is kept from laying, the lower her ability becomes. So at the queen breeders, um, after a queen starts to lay, they're going to cage her, and then they're going to ship her out. And then you're going to receive it. You're going to put her in the hive, and then she's going to stay in the, that queen cage for another three or four days. Um, that means that at a minimum, she's stopped laying for six days. Uh, this reduces her peak ability if she's not allowed to ramp up naturally, like if you put a queen cell into a nuke that you build yourself. And uh, lastly, you get, to want, you get to be the one that chooses the best genetics for yourself. So some guy in California says these are the best queens that you can get for you, but, you know, that doesn't translate into winters over Wisconsin or anything like that. So, all right. First one we're going to cover is the easiest one. It's uh, swarm cells. Okay, so there's no special equipment needed. If you have bees, you already have everything you need. Um, like I said, it's very easy. There's no cost, and you get high-quality queens out of this method. Um, some of the cons, uh, you should use wax foundation. You don't have to. You can use plastic. It's just easier if you have wax. Um, it is time-sensitive. You don't want your best queens to actually swarm. You want to stop them before that. And um, generally, only a few splits can be made in that way per hive. And the original hive probably won't have a honey crop. And I'll explain that in a second, depending on whether you use plastic foundation or wax foundation. So, know the difference. Swarm cells versus emergency cells. Swarm cells, they're usually built on the bottoms and around the edges of the frame. Um, and because that's the best temperature to raise those queens, the bees know that, so that's generally where they want to put their swarm cells. Um, sometimes you're going to spot what's up circled up there that's called the queen cup. Um, you don't have to worry about that unless there's actually an egg in it. You can look in there and see if there's an egg. Um, they generally just have those built around the hive. Um, they're just for emergencies, just if they need something, it's already built, it's already there. So if you see one, you don't necessarily have to worry about it. Um, now, emergency cells, they're mostly built in the middle of the frame, right where the brood is always laid in that circle. That's generally where you're going to see the swarm cells. That is because if something happens to their queen, it dies or the beekeeper, like me, smashes her. Um, they'll raise emergency cells, um, and those are going to be right in the center. The reason they do that is they're going to take a larva um, from wherever they can find it, that's the proper age. That's all that matters to them. So they're going to be built around the center like that. So you can actually choose your best ties and kind of force them to swarm. So you pick your best colony, and we have a sheet in that folder that is a little guide. You can actually grade all your queens if you like and pick the best ones. Um, so what you can do is if you have your queens in a two-box standard formation, which most people do. Um, you can force all those bees down into one box, just put the brood down in the bottom box and then shake the rest of the bees in there. Um, if you just run a one box colony, you can toss in a couple extra frames of capped brood and uh, even shake in some more nurse bees off of other frames. Just make sure you don't accidentally shake a queen in there. Um, and this will initiate that hive to, to swarm. And um, but you have to really keep an eye on that hive. They can swarm in less than 12 days once they decide to start. A lot of times 
they'll they'll even swarm before those last cells are capped off. So you really have to watch them. Um, so when the cells are capped and starting to be capped, that's when you need to act. Okay. So you cut the cells out of the wax, and you make sure you cut a big chunk around it. Some of those wouldn't work just because they're touching the wood. It'd be hard to cut those out without damaging them. Um, but you cut out a big chunk of wax above them, and that way you can use that as kind of like a handle so that when you make your nukes, you can just push that part of the wax into the frame in your nuke so you don't damage the queen cell at all. Um, now, if you're only using plastic foundation frames, you can't really do that, so you'll have to take that entire frame out and just put it into the nuke that you're building. And that's why I mentioned that you might lose some of your honey crop if you take, you know, five frames of capped brood and those queen cells out of that hive, you're pretty much going to lose your honey crop on that um, initial hive for that year. So, all right. Next one is the Miller method. Um, some of the best things about the Miller method, it's still an easy method. Um, there's still little to no cost whatsoever. No additional equipment is needed. Um, you get good queens of it from it more queens generally than just raising swarm cells in a hive. Some of the cons about it, um, you have to use uh, wax foundation. Um, so what you can do is um, the original method that C.C. Miller did is he wanted you to cut the foundation like this, then stick it in the hive and let the queen lay along the edges, um, and then take this frame out and put it into the frame that you want into the hive that you want to raise those queens. Um, the only thing is I found this takes way too much work. Um, you have to do multiple manipulations. You have to get in the hive lots of times to see if the queen is actually laying eggs along that edge. So the method that I like to use, it's a lot easier. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So like I said, C.C. Miller developed this method. Um, it's one of the easiest methods that you can use. So what you do is you make a nuke with several frames of bees. So you can just take four frames of bees, nurse bees, shake them into a nuke box. Doesn't matter. It can be a plastic one, cardboard one, doesn't matter. Um, so then you're also going to want to take three frames of capped brood, stick it in that box, and then two frames of food. Uh, you want honey and pollen both in there, um, not just two, two frames of honey. So you want the Bottom line is, is you want a lot of bees in this box. So after five days, you're going to open that box back up and they're going to have built emergency queen cells all over on those frames. You have to remove all those queen cells because that's not the genetics that you're choosing from the queen that you want to raise from. So what you have to do is take out every single frame, shake it off, remove any queen cell that's on those. Okay. Um, this will ensure that they're actually, like I said, raising the queens that you want to raise, okay? So then what you do, this is the easier method that I like. You remove a frame of capped brood and eggs from the donor hive that you've chosen, okay? So then all you have to do is cut triangles out of the wax exactly where the line is, where the eggs end, and the larvae start and blow it. It's usually empty. Um, it doesn't have to look perfect like that. In fact, it'll look jagged all over. You know, you just basically follow that line. The reason you're cutting those out of there is so that the bees have more room to draw queen cells downward, um, and it gives them a lot more room to be able to work with that. So after you cut that, you place the frame into the center of the nucleus colony. The nurse bees in the hive, they'll start drawing out queen cells right away. Then you want to do, just like any time you're raising any queens, is feed the hives. Give them pollen patties, give them light syrup. They have to have good nutrition to raise good queens. That's it. Um, you want them to have more than they might ever need. Even if they have a good pollen flow, they're going to use that pollen flow to actually raise the queens. But you, you never want them to, you know, run out of anything. So you want them nicely fed. Um, nine days later, you take the frame out of the queenless nuke that you've made, and it'll hold the queen cells. So one thing you have to be careful of using this method is the, the nurse bees will not necessarily choose that.
that four day old day. They might choose a five day old day. Then you're one day ahead of schedule. That one queen will emerge first and she'll go around and kill the other ones. So you have to keep an eye on it. Start checking it, um, you know, a couple days later. Just make sure, see how they're doing. You might have to take them out one day sooner than you anticipated. So um, you're going to cut out those queen cells again using a sharp knife. And just like before, leave a big chunk of wax above it. Okay, that way you can just stick it right into the frame of the new nukes that you built. Now, sometimes those queen or those nurse bees, they're going to make three, four, five queen cells all touching each other. And it doesn't make sense to try to cut them apart because you're just going to damage them anyway. It's okay if you put three or four or five queen cells into one hive. Like I said, the first one that emerges is just going to come out and kill the other ones. So the queen will emerge on day 16 from the day that the eggs were laid. Okay. So like I said, if they choose an egg that's a little bit older than that, it'll be a day sooner. So once she emerges, she'll walk around in the hive for three or four days. Her wings will harden, and then she'll start going on mating flights. Um, when she's done with mating flights, you know, sometimes they only have to go once. Sometimes it takes three or four days. It just depends on number of drones in the area. Um, after she's done, it'll take three or four days before she starts laying eggs. So what that means is you don't start to look in those hives for about 14 days till after you put those queen cells in those noobs. All right. Okay, so the pros and cons of grafting. Um, you're in total control of the genetics that you use. You can graft an unlimited number of queens. Um, the time You can time queen emergence to coincide with the nectar flow. It's one of the most satisfying ways of raising queens, we think. Um, and you can sell any queens you don't use. So it can be very profitable. You could sell queens anywhere from $30 to $60. Um, the cons, it's very time consuming. Uh, extensive time management and logistical planning are required. Uh, there's lots of equipment and tools that are needed and you really need to have good eyesight because it's possible to see them sometimes. Um, so grading hives and queens for grafting selection. There's several factors um, when choosing what queen you're going to graft from, and that's really what this grading form is all about. So you're going to you're going to include factors like, and you could change this form to be whatever you want. There's so many different things you can pick from. The queen origins, um, her age and experience. You never want to graft from a queen that's not at least a year old and has survived winter. Um, the queen's health, make sure she's got all six legs, her wings are intact, and especially her antennas. Queens use their antennas to measure cells because that's how they know what egg goes in that cell. Drone cells are bigger, queen cells are definitely bigger, so they need their antennas. Make sure that queen is in excellent health. You want a uh, queen, uh, choose from a hive that has a low mite count. Um, you, the bees actually do help take care of mites in their hives, they should. Um, be very hygienic and keep their mite counts down. It helps them survive winter. The more mites, the more viruses they can have. Um, you can choose uh, how many times you've treated them. If you've treated them over and over again and they, you just can't get that mite count down, they're not going to survive winter. I wouldn't graft from that hive. Um, their color, bees, bees can be light yellow, dark yellow, brown, golden. Um, you can choose that by color pattern. Um, one of the other ones is their brood pattern. You can see this brood pattern. So up in the corners, you, that's usually where the honey's going to be, even on the bottoms usually. And then around that's going to be the nectar and the bee bread, which is pollen mixed with enzymes that they feed the babies with. And then the brood will be in the center. And uh, this is a pretty good laying, brood laying pattern. You'll see that the cells are sporadic on this. That's because this hive has a VSH queen. And the bees, the workers can go around and they will take brood out of the cells if they if they can tell there's a mite in there. They'll empty that cell, take the brood out, get rid of it, get rid of the mite. And that's what VSH queens do. Um, their temperament. Okay. When we first started doing bees, I wanted nothing to do with it. It was my husband and my son. And we ordered bees that were... Um, 
Buckfast. Buckfast, yes. And we got him from Texas. And you get within 100 feet of these bees and they'd come after you. They were terrible. And my son even got stung on the back of his neck through his veil. So you really don't want to breed bees that are aggressive. You want docile bees that are calm. You know, you walk up to them. You don't even have to wear a veil sometimes because they're just so calm. Um, honey production. You really want a good balance of honey and bees. If this queen has been working on getting her bees to make bees, and that's all, and if you don't have a queen excluder on, you're noticing they're, she's even laying up in the brood boxes, and that's what they're focusing on are laying bees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want a good balance between their honey production and the, the production of those bees. And then up here, you want to make sure those queens are winter hardy. So if they don't, you know, if the hive is really, really weak after winter and it just can't get up off the ground afterwards, I don't think I would choose from that hive to graft from. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, letters A through D, which cell would you graft, would you choose out of these? D. 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 Which one? D. 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 That's an egg. D. Oh. <laughs> okay. So A is too old. Um, you're not going to want to choose A because... If you have other queens that are in there that are younger, she's going to get out and she's going to sting them and kill them all. And she's going to be the queen of all of them. <laughs> B, it's not a very well-fed larva. I don't see much royal jelly in there. It's pretty dry. Um, C is actually the perfect one. Um, you want them small and in the small, skinny C shape. And then D is an egg, and you never want to graft an egg. So what should you be grafting? So identifying ages of larva. So you can tell this is just laid, it's standing up. That's how they look right when they lay them. This is actually one that's hatching. So you definitely don't want to graft anything like this. So you see how that C shape, it's really skinny. They are very hard to see. Um, and then you wouldn't want to graft one of these older ones, especially not the chubby bee. Um, <laughs> if... if the bees notice that a graft isn't right. They'll remove it from that queen cell and tear it down. And it won't even be into your percentages as a queen you can use. So choose your best colony to graft from. The traits you want to promote are endless. But most people now promote traits on how they reduce the numbers of mites in the hives. So one week before you graft, put on pollen patties and one-to-one -one syrup on that hive. One week before you grab, oh, I said, sorry. <laughs> you want the hive to have plenty of great food to feed the larva that you'll be grafting. So you want it to be strong. Um, create your cell builder and finisher as shown in the handout. We printed you a handout on how to build those. Um, you want to have patties and syrup on the, cell, on the cell builder hive as well. Graft only four day old, one day old larva that's just hatched. This is one of the most important steps in grafting quality queens. If they're too old, the queens will be substandard. Um, there's a saying goes, graft the ones you can't see. Uh, make sure the grafts are all the same age. If you accidentally graft an egg that's just one day older than the rest, she'll emerge early and kill the other queens. She can literally sting right through their cells, their queen cells. Um, and she knows to do this. Um, graft your cells in a warm, dark room. The contrast will help with vision and the warm, damp broom will keep the larva from drying out. Um, as you're grafting, so as you're grafting, you're going to probably be moving left to right. So you'll put a larva in the first cell and you'll take your warm, damp rag and just put it over there just to keep it warm and moist. And you'll do that and move along. Mike and I have a bowl of hot water with rags in it and we just keep bringing them out and changing the rags so they stay warm and moist for them. Um, So you'll remove the two center frames from your cell builder and you'll place one frame of pollen and the grafting frame. So when you have all your grafts done, they'll be upside down like this in your frame, in your hive. Um, leave them alone. Don't open the hive. Don't peek. I mean, seriously, you know that bees will use propolis on this top. And when you go to lift it, it pops and that can jolt the eggs loose if it's or, or the larva loose. Another thing is every time you open that hive, you're letting in a draft of cold air. You know, you don't want to draft your queen babies. You want them to be perfect. 
just try, wait it out and be patient. We're not patient either. We have to yell at each other because Mike has to peek at everything. Yeah, I do. So on day 14, 10 days after grafting, you can open the hive and check the grafts. Place your cell protectors on at this time. That would be these easy peasy cages if you use easy peasy. Um, so with our students, we let our students graft for the first time. They're not always going to pick the right larva. So they're going to emerge early. So we put these on and they're made for, for JZBZ. Snaps on the frame just like that. And it'll keep the queen. If they emerge early, they can't get out and sting all your other ones. Um, on day 15, 11 days after grafting, place your cells into your queen mating nukes. If you grafted four day old eggs, they'll emerge 12 days later, 16 days total. Oh, I can't go back. Huh? Okay. So this is what we did when we were teaching the students. These are the easy peasy cages we use. And this is number four is what they look like when you get them all on the queen cells. And so. I still have a queen cell from last year. I saved everything. It's a queen cell. So when you use these and you're ready to take them out to transfer, they fit right into the JZBZ cage, just like that. And you can put it right in there um, and let her emerge. If the bees aren't used to her yet, they won't kill her right away because she's in here. In a few days, you can release her. Um, if she has emerged in this cage this they have candy plugs you can fill and put in there and i gave you a recipe for the con the fondant candy so oh i know i did sorry so grafting tools so we'll pass these around so you can see them okay so the chinese grafting tool is my tool of choice mike doesn't like it but i do it has a little scoop on the end and it has a plunger. So when you get that larva on there, you can push it off into the cup. And I like that. Mike likes the Jay-Z Beasy grafting tool. Um, it has a very, very, very fine tip and it breaks easy. Mike goes through them. We have to buy a lot of those. Um, we've never had a master grafting tool, so I can't vouch for it and tell you how good or bad it is. Um, the German grafting tool Mike had to file down. It wasn't picking up the larva very well. So he filed it with a metal file so it would grip better and stick to it better. And then the left-handed tool we tried and didn't work because we're not left-handed. So we keep it for our students to use that are left-handed. So in 2020, our dentist called and said, we're canceling all your appointments. You can't come in. So we bought dental tools. Um, a set from the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And I stole them. And he stole them for grafting. <laughs> they look great for grafting. Yeah, but there are a few flat ones that work. But if you've ever seen dental tools up close or touched them, they're very sharp. So we were cutting larva in half. We were destroying the comb. It just wasn't working. So if you want to try it, go ahead. Um, one of them will probably work. So there's other grafting items you can have. I never wear my glasses. Mike wears contacts. He sees way better than me. They come with, these lighted magnifiers come with different um, strengths. So I need a stronger one than Mike does. And then there's the grafting station. I would definitely recommend getting one of these. Because when you graft, you need two hands. You really do. If you're holding a frame in one hand and trying to hold on to your bar so it doesn't tip over, um, it's difficult. And then you end up having to lay your frame down while you're doing that. And you smash all the brood on the other side. It's messy. Um, Hands-free is just way better. And then there's the easy peasy queen cell cages. And I definitely, if you use JZBZ, I would definitely get those easy peasy queen cell cages. They're worth it. So the queen mating nukes you can use. The first one are these queen mating, the minis. We just got these, so we've never used them. They have an entrance in the front. When you get these, when you put your bees in here, you put them upside down. So you'll shake your bees in upside down and put them in the fill. They actually come with the feeder a cover, and three frames. 
So Mike and I took wax foundation and we put wax foundation in there and we use melted wax to glue it up in there. Um, we just feel that this gives them a head start when we're, they're making these. So, and the second one, you can get these wooden uh, mating nukes from Dadent or Man Lake. Um, I think they hold two frames on each side and you can hold two um, mating nukes in there. The third one Mike built. So Mike took a piece of plywood and a uh, Langstroth 10 frame box and he sealed the bottom. There's no entrance on the bottom whatsoever. And he made two dividers in there so we could put three queen mating nukes in this. Really cheap to do this. And then if you drill holes in the sides and in the front, they have entrances. Um, you have you can't use an inner cover with this. You have to just use a flat piece of plywood um, and that works. So two days before the queens emerge, you need to build your mini queen mating nukes. Frame, um, use frames with wax starter foundation to speed up the process rather than using the naked frames. Um, add two cups of nurse bees. So you'll wanna shake nurse bees off and those will be the bees that are on the brood, on frames of brood in your donor hive. You'll shake them off. He took one of my baskets and he shake, uses that to shake them off and scoop them up. But you need two cups of nurse bees per mating nook. Um, and that's about 1200 bees. Uh, make sure they have one-to-one -one syrup in the feeder in the mating nooks, close it up, and the next day, about after 24 hours, um, open it up to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be, um, which is drawing out that wax and getting it ready for a new queen. If you are just using regular mating nooks, like those wooden ones I showed you, um, you'll need a donor resource hive to take frames from. So you're gonna need three frames of brood and food for each nook, and they need to be made the day before emergence. Um, you make your regular mating nukes a day before instead of two days before like those because um, the bees will start making their own queen if more than a day goes by and they won't accept the new queen that you put in. Um, so I wanted to give you an example of when you pick the hive that you wanna graft from. Well, this is hive A, B, and C. So hive A had 100 pounds of honey on it, excellent honey um, crop. Um, had good brood pattern, and uh, she made it through winter. But this hive had 10 to 15 mites every month we did an alcohol wash. So this is probably not a hive we're going to graft from. So this hive, hive B, was extremely docile, very tame bees. Um, we didn't have to treat for mites, um, you know, but... Um, it wasn't very winter hardy. It was very weak coming out of winter. Um, I wouldn't use it just because it might not survive the next winter. And hive C, it only had about 80 pounds of honey on it, which is still a good honey crop. It's extremely docile. And the mite count on this hive, every time we did it was under three mites. We never had to treat it. This is most likely the hive we would graft from uh, um, using those factors. So if you're going to be grafting queens, this is one of the best tools that you can get right here. This is a queen um, isolation cage. You can get them from Better Bee, but other places have them as well. Because um, the problem is you'll go out to your donor hive to graft and you'll pick up one frame and it has five or ten cells that you can graft from. And then you pick up another one and that has 20. And it, it's just... Um, you know, makes a mess trying to dig through there. It takes a lot of time. So this is the easiest way to do it. So all you have to do is take a, a drone comb. It has to be empty, nothing on. I mean, it can have some honey up on the top. Uh, but you take that empty frame and you get your queen and you put it on that frame. Then you slip that frame right down into this. And then this goes right back down into the donor hive. Okay. So the bees, they can pass through this the queen cannot so she'll be stuck in there so um she'll lay this entire frame full for you um you're going to leave it in that configuration for about five days um sometimes six just depending you might have to check on it um because you want those those cells that are exactly four days old those eggs those larvae um 
So, like I said, if you leave it in there for five days, there should be hundreds of larvae on here that are exactly the right age that you can grab from. So this has really cut down on a lot of time of trying to dig through the hives and find the exact cells that you want. Um, and actually, this is honestly one of the only times that I prefer uh, a black plastic foundation over wax foundation. It is a lot easier to see those little larvae on the black plastic foundation than is, is on wax. It really is. So, all right. So there are thousands of different ways that you can raise queens, really. Um, everybody has their own ideas and methods, but there's just a few basic scientific things that you have to follow. Um, one of them is great nutrition on every hive that you're going to raise queens on. You don't want these queens lacking in anything that they might need. Um, I also add uh, additives like Hive Alive to the syrup. It gives the bees a little extra nutrients, and they'll take that one-to-one -one syrup down a lot faster if it has some additives in it. Um, it's best if you can time the emergence of the queens during a nectar flow, okay? They're going to be a lot more likely to accept those queens that you put in the nukes if there's a nectar flow going on. If there's a dearth um, and there's no pollen coming in, no nectar coming in, um, it's going to be a lot lower chance of them accepting that queen. So if you are grafting, um, make sure that you graft a lot more than you think you're going to need, okay? So let's say you graft 100 queen cells. Um, if you're good at grafting, you'll have probably 90 that those bees will draw out and cap for queen cells. Then you're going to put those into nukes. Um, generally, about 80 of them will hatch. And then in the long run, in a good year, you'll have about 65 that come back that are mated and ready to start going. Um, these aren't scientific numbers. These are just the averages that we get. Um, some of you will have better. Some of you will have worse. So. Um, and then graft from only the healthiest colonies that you have. You want to make sure they have low mites, no chalk brood, no FB, EFB, nothing like that. So, um, and lastly, um, there's been a little product that came out onto the market uh, in the past couple of years. And it's a really nice tool. Uh, this gentleman, Brian, him and his friend developed it. Um, and he can talk about it a lot better than I can. So... I'll leave the floor to Brian. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So everybody who, uh, as far as, and I'll try and keep this short, everybody that knows me, especially my wife, she'll tell you, I'll just run my mouth and run my mouth. Um, the short and sweet here, okay, who, as far as beekeeping, who gets intimidated by all the record keeping? who loses track of <laughs> what's going on in this hive, what's going on in that hive. You lose track easily. So we who have... Who uses rocks? <laughs> who, yeah, who uses, who uses bricks, sticks, anything like that. So the slogan that we say with Queen Right Dial is ditch the brick, okay? What you have here on the right-hand side, I got it, your left, we have a status indicator. Now, with the status indicator, this is a post-inspection system where you inspect your colony, okay? And right now, if you look at it, now on the left-hand side, you have mated queen. If you see swarm cells, supersede your cells, if there's a virgin queen, or if you find no queen, no cells, okay? So post-inspection, you can adjust the dial to whatever you found. Makes it easy, Okay works there's a small little ridge on here if you have gloves works perfect okay you make that adjustment now right now you should have a mated queen um if you're you know most of the folks in here around here if you're bruce down south well this wouldn't apply so bruce don't listen but right now you should have a mated queen and she should be from 2023 right so you know right here that colony of a mated queen, what year the queen is from, okay? Let's say life gets busy, okay? And you go in and you inspect your colony, you find a swarm cell, okay? You can turn that dial so that you know you had a swarm cell. In the middle, we have a sticker on here with an IF&T that is inspect, feed, treat. 
And then a next action, you can use a dry erase and mark right on that indicator when you should go back into that colony, okay? So as far as when you check your colony, having to grab a notebook and all this and that, you can make your adjustments right here, take a dry erase, mark the date. Very easy, okay? I had several colonies last year that I had 2021 20, queens in. And even with the max that I got up to was 21 colonies, I couldn't keep track. I would look out and I'm like, which ones were the two that had the 21 queens? I knew just by looking at, the, at my dials. Okay. Now, who in here, um, as far as queen rearing, who in here is intimidated by that whole process? It's the timing and everything related to queen rearing. It's why I never did it. I just, that's the one thing in beekeeping that I'm like, I don't know. What we have with the mating indicator is a dial where you can see the dates and then you have all of the developmental stages. So you'll know just by looking at this, let's say you go in and you know, you find a swarm cell. You could use your mating indicator and you know you found a capped cell. You can make your adjustments and know exactly on this mating indicator when they should be emerging, when they're making their mating flights, and then dating-wise, when you should see a confirmed mated queen so you see eggs. Now, this is in the perfect world. We all know weather and everything affects every element here. So this is an easy system with queen rearing. So you know if you graft, you can take this, you adjust it, so you graft it on the 16th, and you'll know then when you should have, you know, each developmental-wise, okay, well, when should she be emerging, et cetera, okay? Very easy system. We have a pod-type system right here that easily you can just throw in your pocket. You don't have that large card. You don't have any little metal dials, anything like that. So perfect system here. The two between the status indicator and the mating indicator, the parts are interchangeable. So you could take the screw out of here, take the date disc and the top developmental plate and plop them right onto this one here. <laughs> so it's a fully interchangeable system. It takes record keeping to, it simplifies it, okay? It's the one area in beekeeping that I've always struggled with. Um, I bought a fancy book that had a gold kind of etched bee in it, and I'm like, this is going to be the year, you know? I think I took notes on two inspections, and after that, I'm like, I don't have time for it. So the queen right dial really takes record keeping and simplifies it for beekeepers because there's a lot of aspects in beekeeping that just they stress you out you know and if jason uh, my partner and i if we can with this queen right dial simplify that record keeping simplify as far as queen rearing that's our goal so i do have some of these if anyone's interested in these the mating indicators i do have some here um, we have a website set up as well, queenrightdial.com. Um, so, anyone have any questions? Now, while you're thinking, this is like, I'm almost like an infomercial, I can say, but wait, there's more. Okay. Beekeeping. Jason and I, who are both beekeepers, um, we wanted to make a product also that will last. So, what these are made out of, it's UV tolerant. Your stickers are non-fade. So as far as if you're thinking, well, I'm going to put that on there and every year I'm going to have to buy these things and spend, you know, an hour replacing all these dials. I have one downstairs that I used throughout the entire season last year, and I can show you perfectly fine. Mother Nature tends to clean off any dirt. Um, I live in Northeast Ohio. So similar, like here, we get winters, we get all of that weather. So in the same day, we'll have, you know, snow in the morning and then it warms up. And later in the afternoon, I got shorts and a t-shirt on. So, but these are weather resistant, weather tolerant, UV resistant. So great tool. All right.
Brian is our special guest, so oh, he's going to pick the ticket. The winning. On to the hype. It does, yes, sir. Yeah, there's a, a stainless screw on here. If you want to adhere this, you know, attach this to the hive, you can take that screw out, plop this back pot off, and it would just screw right on the front of the hive pot. Yeah. Does anyone not have a ticket? There's one. All the suspense. <laughs> so, ticket number. Oh man, uh, ending in one nine eight. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So we recorded the session. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you guys need to, if you missed anything, if you want to take better notes or anything like that, you can watch it. You know, anytime you like. So. Questions? I think you said. Yeah. Could you? Uh, I grabbed it, and mm -hmm. it's just so time-consuming, and my eyes are the issue anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but did you mention that you have an app on your phone? I do. Um, let me find my phone. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's in your bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, what the app does is um, you can put in exactly what day you grafted, and then it'll tell you what day you should take that cell out, what day you should put it in. All right. It's called Queen Calendar. I have that on my laptop, so they now have a mobile version for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And it, it has other information you can put in, the location of the apiary, all that stuff, so. But the downfall with this is you have to be smart enough to make sure you put in the right date before you do it. Yeah, queen down. Oh. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, when you're shaking bees into the, your nook, mm -hmm. do they have to all come from the same hive? No. Okay. No. They don't fight? There might be a little bit of fighting here and there, but in general, they get along. Anybody else? When's, right. your, when's your class on um, um, grafting? In May. The, the yeah. one in grafting is in May. Okay. Yeah. There's and a we, sheet in your bag. If you got a yellow bag, they would have put a sheet. And there's one okay. in your folder that right. tells the dates and all the info on it. Okay. And last year, the weather was so bad that we actually had to postpone it a whole week to be able to, to graft. So. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, as, if you're cheap, you find me. Um, those JZBZ, mm -hmm. if you get CBC tubing, yeah. you got it, um, or whatever link you need, drill little holes in it, put a wood, wood dowel on the bottom, they work great instead of the easy pieces if you're cheap. Oh, yeah. The reason we <laughs> really like those is because they clip straight yeah. onto this bar, yeah, so it makes it right really easy. The, the CB, uh, CPBC right. it's right over the thing. And oh, the does it? Yeah, oh, okay. It yeah. We use them a lot. Uh -huh. So, so I've never used those. I've used an incubator instead. Oh, wow. It's really nice okay. to get rid of the incubator and use those. And that's weird to say that, to hear you say that because most people start doing this way, it this way, and then later on when they start doing a lot of graphs, then they'll start using an incubator. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. So I should but, keep the incubator. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're going to keep doing it. Yeah, it's... But... um. We don't we don't graft enough to, um, I think, really need an incubator because we'll do a full set of graphs like 90 graphs, and then that'll be good enough for June, you know, May June. Then we'll do another one in July, and then if there's some queens that aren't doing very well, then we'll do another small one in August. It's a lot harder to do it in August though because it's usually a dearth at the beginning of August, so. Did y'all pass up the grafting tools? And... Yeah. Continue. And there's a lot of handouts within the folders as well on yeah. how to build a, a queen cell builder. Um, 
there's there's a couple more in there, so. Uh, more folders. Sorry, is there more folders? There were. They told us we were capped at 32, so that's what we the tech gave us for printouts. Um. um it, I'm sure there's a copy machine right at the end of the hallway. Mm -hmm. If you talk to one of the ladies at the tech, you know, that signed you in, She'll make they'll copies make copies for you. Yeah. Of anything in there. All right. Crafting tools. Oh, really? oh use well, I don't know. That's all, all of them. Except the... Oh. Good job, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah. Not too important, but he wants to say good job, I guess. Matthew, oh. I don't know him. Uh -huh. I don't. I don't. Do you guys want to keep this? Can you use it in classes or anything? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Can you print? Yeah, we can okay. use it. Please. What? Yeah. I did. I hit end. It's, it's still going. Oh, there's a second. You have to hit it twice. 